Alrighty, hello everyone and welcome to the first workshop of the IBA conference. Um, this is the integrated population model workshop and I'd like to introduce Paul Lucas and Josh Nowak um, from Speedgoat and so we'll let them take it away and do introductions and start their workshop. All right, hello everybody. I'm Paul Lucas I'm with Speedgoat Wildlife Solutions and the University of Montana. Um, and yeah, we're here to chat about integrated population models for bears and quick let Josh introduce himself as well. Hello. Uh, yeah, Josh Noah, Speed Goat. And uh, yeah, I'll just, I guess broadly, we work with a lot of different agencies and we do a lot of uh, statistical modeling and data storage kind of solutions. A lot of that is centered on integrated population models. So Happy to be here and share some of what we've learned over the last 10 or so years of, of doing this. All right, screen sharing working well there. Uh, so yeah, welcome again. It's great to see a bunch of names of people I know pop up on the screen and then good to see a bunch of people that I don't know also. So. Welcome. Um, so for today's workshop, we're going to chat about some practical applications of population integrated population models. Um, thinking about bears a lot because this is a bear conference, but there's nothing specific about these models to bears. They work for, I put similar species here, but we can take similar in the broadest of, of uh, senses. These models really work across a wide range of species. And I want to think about these models too as not just a population models, but as a way of thinking about how we're building a monitoring program and building a data stream for our bear populations. All right, so unlike a lot of statistically minded people who go out thinking about their modeling endeavors from a data and like number crunching point of view. We like to think about our models as a way of building good governance for wildlife. And if we think about the Wildlife Management Institute put out these set of wildlife governance principles uh, based around adaptive and strategic thinking, evidence-based inference, transparency and accountability, uh, inclusion and capacity to deliver conservation, we really think about modeling frameworks in a way that produce those sorts of governance principles uh, so that the model is kind of just a central link of those concepts. And so we'll bounce kind of back and forth between that in the next hour and a half, uh, kind of hit on where that all goes. Oh, and as Lori said, if you have questions, um, you can stick them in the chat or raise your hand. I'll try to hit those as quickly as I can. I'm not always the best at finding questions when they pop up, so Josh is going to help me with that as well. Okay, so let's think about some models um, and think about using the models as a guide for our workflow in ecological inference. Uh, so the first part of that is all of these gobs of data that are out there. Ecologists collect and maintain a lot of data. Uh, all sorts of things from counts to uh, telemetry survival information, genetic surveys, all sorts of things, just tons of data flowing. Um, and it's stored in lots of formats, lots of locations um, with varying levels of quality control. Typically at the individual biologist level, they care a ton or you all care a ton about what you're doing. And at that level, there's really high quality control as it wraps up in a group of biologists come together or a group of agencies come together that that sort of enterprise level, things are in different formats and different styles and things. And then the quality control can, can drop a bit because it's hard to share information if it's not 
in a common kind of setup. So kind of think about cleaning that up. Sort of brings us to this idea of a workflow management. How do we make these data pass from collection on through our analysis in our integrated population model? There's sort of an old way of doing this, um, old way, common way, I don't know, just a better way, uh, but where you would start, where's my, uh, see if my cursor worked on the screen, oh, laser park there, so we can sort of start on the left here, and you might build a map in ArcGIS to determine your location, your bear population, collect some data, maybe analyze it in R, then you're back on your path. You have to give a presentation, you might do it in PowerPoint, report in Word, and then all your graphs are in Excel. You're in a bunch of dead end kind of situations where you're copying and pasting from one thing to another, and moving stuff around. That leads to complicated reporting. But we can use modern tools instead to help leverage all of this into a common workflow where we can define our population, store our data in a way that reflects the populations and the potential that we might change what we're thinking about in populations, have our data storage uh, system, a database, hopefully provide some data integrity checks do the analysis, fit models, produce the reports, and then set your licenses or whatever your bear management program is right back into defining population. So if we can keep this all in one clean flow, we can sort out a lot of these kind of dead end points. Uh, and integrated population models really help in this idea because they both provide you this data fitting, model fitting, data analysis end of things, but they also help suggest what your data should be, help you suggest what a clean format of that data should be. And then as the model fitting process goes on, we can think about what, whether they reflect actual biological populations. Um, and then they help you think about setting licenses or, or other conservation goals. It may be reintroductions, whatever change in population, population manipulation you might have going on. So we wanna to work towards this sort of common loop to through integrated population models. And then as we're doing this, there's sort of all these standard conservation challenges um, where we've got long streams of irregular data, we might have a whole bunch of different jurisdictions. It's rare to see a bear population that sits entirely within one management agency's jurisdiction. Um, and all these sorts of things can be scale dependent. So can we come up with a way that we can drill down into fine scales or expand out into broader scales and kind of clean ways. Okay, so let's uh, start diving into or ideas of models. And we use models every day, whether we think about it or not. Um, every time we come up with an idea of what our bear population is or what it's doing, there's some sort of model involved. None of us know exactly how bears operate. Um, so we need to make some sort of inferential step. Sometimes it's just a mental model that's guiding what we're doing. Sometimes it might be a complex matrix model or some other mathematical model. Um, but regardless what it is, um, by writing it down in its mathematical format, we can take away kind of the scariness. I know it might sound scary to have the math written down, but it actually helps us get away from these mental ideas and can turn our scary, scary model into something more pleasant, like a donut. If we kind of keep our conversation light, we can keep them more donut-like than Lefkowitz matrix-like. 
Okay. I have all times for my phone to ring. Um, so we want to think about how we're going to use our data um, to answer questions and evaluate outcomes. So basically there might be ecological questions we need to answer, um, or we might need to make some sort of prediction for in, uh, for some conservation action or license setting or something else like that. We want to be able to overcome a series of data problems. We're almost always um, caught with limited data. And so when I think about limited, that's where budgets are coming in, into play. So you, can, you can't collect data on every single measure at every single time. And then there's cases where there's missing data. So that's the case where you would hope to collect it, but for one reason or another, a bad storm, a plane broke down, whatever it was, you couldn't get that chunk of data. Um, and then data might be collected at different scales. So we might have survival estimates from collaring at the scale of a national park. There might be mortality estimates or that are from roadsides, you know, observations of roadkill. There could be um, recruitment studies that are done some other scale, uh, maybe by a different agency. And so we're trying to push all these data together that weren't necessarily intended to go together. And then just the various logistical constraints. Uh, we're all ecologists sitting here and we know the ridiculous um, costs of trying to uh, actually collect data in ecological situations, and especially on something like a bear it's covering huge amounts of areas and exist at low densities. So our whole goal here is to get the most we can out of our limited data. All right, so spent 10 minutes or so giving various reasons of why we want to be integrating our data, how we're going to approach this. So let's actually start getting into the guts a little bit. So integrated population models rep represent multiple models in one uh, overarching model. So there's a process model that's gonna describe the biology. It might look a lot like matrix models are used to using. And then there's gonna be an observation model it's gonna relate data to the parameters in the biological model. So it's observational model in the sense that it's the model of how you observe the data, the sort of process by which the data arose and data have to come from the animals. Um, and so there's a link from there, from the data to the biology. Uh, and Schaub and Abadi have this slick paper in 2011 um, it's actually from an ornithology journal, but it applies just as well to bears. Um, and they describe integrated population models as any model that jointly analyzes data on population size and demographic parameters all in one case. And by bringing these process models together, the, the observation model, we have a chance to reduce the amount of possibilities that are out there for what our model can be telling us. You can observe a lot of variation bouncing around in your observational data that isn't necessarily real in terms of how the animals are gonna vary. So small sample sizes and other artifacts can make your data bounce around. But we know that bears are limited somewhat in how much their biology is gonna vary. They have a, can only have a few cubs at a time we know the adult survival is quite high from year to year. So there are some bounds on, on where the, the population can actually go. And our process model helps us do that. And that keeps our observations in line and allows us to get more out of information out of the whole process. Okay, so let's step slowly 
through a basic piece of an integrated population. So let's just start on the, uh, the newborn class of animals. And so on the left side here, we're just to describe a really basic um, birth model as a component of our integrated population model. So we could have our newborns on the left here are a function of the adults, the pregnancy rate, and the litter size. And so just some simple number of adults times the proportion of adults that are pregnant and times the litter size give you the number of young. All right, so that's straightforward, not, not overly fancy. Then how are we gonna inform that? So we'll bring in our observation model here. And so the red parts are going to be data and then the black parts are parameters. So if we wanna link our pregnancy, so pregnant parameter links right back to the process model, but our observation model could be a binomial. So if we tested a bunch of bears, so this would tested would be some count of bears. That's our data number, number tested as part of our binomial. And then the number positive is also data. So that's how many pregnant animals came out of the number tested. And so through a binomial distribution leads to our estimate pregnancy rate. So if we fit this binomial while we're also bringing together our process model, we get that pregnancy component. Then we might have another piece of data. So there could be a fetus count as well in there. And so that we could say our litter size here. So litter size is a count, small number. Uh, and that could be nicely modeled as a Poisson. And so we could say our counts or observations with Poisson with mean litter size. And that links us right back to our process model. So now we have two observation models linking back to our, uh, our process model describing the biology for uh, the birth rate. And so you can imagine this being done for subadults and adults. In those cases, you would have last year's population size times some survival rate gives you this time year's population size, and maybe there's some telemetry or genetic marker capture photo data or something like that could inform those pieces of the puzzle. Okay, so what does this really mean for us? So these integrated population models are put together to make sense of multiple sources of noisy data. So they're not all going to tell you the same answer. We'll go through a couple of examples on that. Um, but that's really the key, is if you look at any of them alone, you might just be looking at noise, but on the whole, it brings it all together. Um, it brings us a unified framework for analysis of all our data. So we don't want to be looking at them separately. We can bring them all together. Uh, make sure the estimates are self-consistent. We'll go through that too. But very often that we come up with estimates that there's no possible way to make biology link the two together. And then we can have outputs that are useful for management. And we'll sort of go on and wrap up how we got it. Okay. So let's think about this idea of independent data sets and how they're usually analyzed. Uh, typically, if we have survival or pregnancy, abundance, harvest, age composition, uh, we would go and estimate them all separately, 
grab our favorite program for it. If it's survival, we might do it in program mark or we might go into R and do something or whatever your favorite software is. But you can come up with a whole bunch of different estimates. They all have their own confidence intervals. And then you just try to piece it together. And there's some advantages in this that's flexible. There's tons of developed literature and software. Uh, but there's a really big problem with analyzing all your data separately. And that's that they don't all necessarily get along. There can be some key discrepancies um, in the estimates. Okay, so let's take one of our favorite examples of a data discrepancy and you could change this to bears as well, though it would, probably wouldn't be 10,000. Uh, but just imagine we've got a population of 10,000 deer. We, so we estimate that there's 10,000 deer. We estimate that 2,000 were harvested and we estimate a survival rate, total survival of 0.85. So that initially makes me scratch my head a little bit. Uh, because we know that survival and mortality have to sum to one. An animal can either live or die. It can't do both. So if we take our total of one and subtract off survival of 0.85, then that leaves us 0.15 for mortality. We multiply that by 10,000, and there's only 1,500 deer that could have been harvested. Okay, that doesn't really agree with the 2,000. So were there more than 10,000 deer out there to allow us to have 2,000 harvested and still a survival of 0.85? Did we overestimate harvest? Did we overestimate survival or some combination of them? And none of those numbers on their own would make you even blink an eye. But when put together, they don't add up. And so if we don't have a way to link them in an explicit model, we have to do our own mental math about how we make this agree. And so I might come along and bump down survival a little bit, and bump down harvest a little bit to come to make it work out right. And Josh might think I'm full of it. And he goes and he ups population size because he's sure that there were 2,000 elk har or deer harvested because he was at the check station and saw a lot go through. Um, and so everyone can take their own mental model and switch it however they want. If we have an integrated population model that links it all, then there's an explicit set of assumptions laying out how we're going to handle these data discrepancies and everyone can see the same set of logic. All right, so another one that, that pops up pretty commonly is in birth rate kinds of things. So we might go and do a winter um, count of animals. So I guess that doesn't work as great for bears, but maybe you go in right before denning and you observe young with their females and get a ratio of 0.45 young per female. Uh, but you get a survival rate of 0.4. So an elk, we thought about this with only one calf per cow. Uh, if they're survived at 0.4, there can't be 45% ratio left. And so these sorts of discrepancies happen all over the place. Um, and so it could be something that relates to changes in ratios due to harvest or misclassification. Uh, lots of things bring us to data discrepancies. And sort of just from the other direction, you could have estimate a survival that would suggest there should be more than you saw out there. So 
crazy thing with these sort of independent data analyses is there's just too many options out there. You can come up with a legitimate, almost infinite set of hypotheses to describe the fact that your parameters don't line up in a biologically meaningful way. So it's really important that we can write down a coherent model that links the data and allows the estimation to bring a single um, self-consistent set of estimates out. Okay, so the independent model thing is, shouldn't just be thrown out. There are some really good reasons for pointed research questions to be running independent models on data sets. But in terms of like an overall management program, making predictions for the future, it leaves us scratching our heads a bit about what we do with independent estimates, when, especially when they don't all add up. Um, we need something more and an ability to project forward if we're really gonna make some sort of decisions based on these data. Okay, so that was the observation side. We can also think about independent models from the process model side. Um, and so almost always in our life as fuzzy mammal, once a year breeding kinds of things. And well, cougars fall into this too, even though they're not necessarily breeding in a nice pulse, they fit well in the matrix models too. Uh, we can describe our process model pretty nicely in terms of a matrix model where we've got population sizes and some vector, recruitment rates across the top, and survivals down the diagonal. And these are typical stage structured Leslie Lef Lefkovich kind of models that you find in POP2 and Ramus and all sorts of other kinds of standard modeling software. And there's well known to be powerful and flexible and useful and well documented and mechanistic. Uh, but there's a really key problem to them in that they require you to just plug in estimates as if they were true. There's no sense of data fitting within those models. So if we're going with these individual and separate uh, process models, we're then stuck in kind of a simulation mode. So we can take our estimates and maybe their variability, plug them into our model and then simulate it maybe at a couple different rates and see what the model says is going on. It's nice in that it doesn't require data. So if you don't have data, you can still do a simulation. You can incorporate uncertainty and variation in that you can put different values of the parameters are in or simulate them with random draws from a distribution. All will work out. Uh, but it's bad in that the user gets to change their parameter values manually. Uh, and so it leaves a lot to the user to kind of pick a set of values that agree with what they already thought. And then the abundance estimates are really hard to use. It's often relegated to some kind of validation rules. So after you project the model out, did it give you some number back that looks like what you observed? And all of this is just allows it to be really easy just to confirm your prior belief. So if all you need to do is change some parameters until it looks like what you thought it was, it's pretty easy to just come up with what you already thought you knew. Um, and it may not, that may not even be a intended result of the process, but our own inherent beliefs about things or implicit beliefs about things can often lead us to rejecting model outputs that we thought were not valid from the get-go um, in favor of ones that we that confirm what we thought. 
And there's no way in this sort of simulation approach to objectively separate those two concepts. So we don't wanna just be building models that allow us to present things we already knew. Uh, we really wanna be testing hypotheses and, and, and confronting our own assumptions with the data. And if we can do that in a holistic integrated way, we'll come out to a, a better solution. Okay, so well, let's think a bit more about application of our matrix models. And so we could think about some inverse predict, inverse model fitting. So we fit our model to data a bit more objectively. So a simple example, if we just had a model that was last year's population size times a growth rate is next year's population model. We could have three observations of data of the population size, and then we want to estimate the growth rate. So we could just insert our three population sizes and estimate each year's growth rate, but it's not really using all the data at the same time, uh, and just kind of an inefficient way to go about it. Oh, I'm sorry, I actually skipped over a step. So here we're thinking about if we did this through simulation, we could use our abundances to est estimate some population growth rates, then simulate from that and see how well those growth rates produce our three abundance estimates. Or we could use an algorithm to fit them. So some sort of, I don't know, least squares, whatever your favorite algorithm is and ask what the overall value of growth rate is. And this fitting then is gonna be a, give us a better overall view than just the simulation mode. And so it's a bit easier to think about fitting if we've just got one kind of parameter like three values of abundance. But now if we have values of abundance and recruitment and survival, maybe harvest or something like that. There's a whole bunch of other data coming in. The fitting process is a lot more complicated and we need a model that will handle all of them. And so we want our model to sort of act as this overlapping consensus. So where do all the pieces of data overlap to give us this common estimate or common population trajectory? So if we looked at our rather simple Venn diagram here, if our estimate of abundance was about where the A is in abundance, and our estimate of survival was out where the S is, those two values separately don't lead to a common story of where our population is going. But there is some overlap in the variation and uncertainty in those estimates that puts us into a center point of this sort of overlapping consensus of yeah, these are the values are possible, both in, within the variation in the data for that parameter itself and within the variation of all the other parameters we observe. And that overlapping consensus gives us this most likely outcome for our population model. And so the whole concept of the integrated population model is using fitting to achieve this overlapping consensus of multiple data types that also fits into our hypothesized process for how the biology acts. Okay, so quick recap here. So our integrated population model is gonna be a process all our biology 
linked to observations. You know, process is typically an, in some sort of matrix model, and the observations are based on the type of data collected, and they're going to be a statistical model based on data collection. And we want to fit our model. We don't want to just simulate to confirm preconceived ideas. So the fitting allow us to test our assumptions and our hypotheses, the simulations less so. Okay, there's some data side to this too that we need to be thinking about. So our monitoring programs produce all sorts of data. They might be telemetry, it might be tagged individuals, we might do some kind of aerial survey, pregnancy checks, counts of cubs with mom, all sorts of some data come into play. And then we need our model to be able to answer the questions, evaluate our uncertainty, maybe predict two would be sure nice. Um, yeah, then have uncertainty that comes along with that. But all of this comes with sort of common data problems that we need our models to be able to handle. So limited data, so these are the data that you can't collect because of budget constraints. So that might be quantity any given year, might have a small sample size. Uh, whereas frequency may come into play in that you don't, aren't able to collect data every year, um, or maybe not every kind of data in every year. Then there's missing data. So part of the missing data problem being those lost data, either due to field conditions or hard drive failure or whatever. But we often lose data too by changes in methods and boundaries. And this is one of those bit overlooked problems. Um, but if we're going along and we have a method um, that has one set of assumptions that are potentially not well met or it's not exactly tracking the parameter or after we change our method, we might lose the data stream that way. Or if we have data that are say collected at a large scale, and then we change the boundaries of the area we want to make inference to, and it contains halves of two areas we were collecting data, but the data don't have the resolution to separate which half they were in, we might lose data that way too. And then there's a scale problem of whether we're sort of collecting data at some herd or population unit, county, a state, a region, a country. Um, various scales all lead to, to comp problems with our sort of data collection and how we integrate our data in. And so all this, we want to think about how sources of errors then are coming in to our, our model. Um, and so we can think about two sources being process errors, the actual variation in the, the uh, biology and then our variation in the observation. So if we have no error going on, we might just have a flat line. And then if we had some process variation, so this is really what we're after. So how's the population changing through time? Then we throw observation error on top of that and we have this sort of clouded view of how the population is moving through time. And as we think about our integrated population model, we can start to separate out 
that observation from the process error uh, through the multiple sets of data over time and by having this underlying process model. Okay, so we have, there are data deficiencies out there, but we don't wanna to get too hung up on them. Um, certainly we support collecting the best data you can, but we don't wanna just run scared when there are data deficiencies. We wanna be able to overcome them or at least um, work with them through our modeling process and still be able to predict future populations, evaluate status, and defend our management decisions. And so if we're gonna get over this, the best option is a nice, well-designed statistical sampling plat, uh, design monitoring program. It's always our best line of defense, uh, but there's often times that these observation models can help us to get around some of our common data problems. Um, through that, we might be able to incorporate detection probabilities. Uh, we might be able to say if there's just a count, be able to estimate what proportion of the population does that count reflect. Um, is there a way that we can expand out from uh, neighboring areas with survival data to be able to form another area? Um, so we can start to get around these ideas of limited and missing data through integrated population modeling. And then if all that isn't working still and you're in a situation where your data are still quite limited, uh, there's op opportunities in integrated population models to incorporate expert opinion as well. Um, and so we often fit these models in a Bayesian framework that allows us to bring in other information through prior distributions or as hypothetical data. Um, it's fairly easy to incorporate. Uh, it at least provides a rigorous method for evaluating assumptions. To know that opinion is not data, but it certainly allows us, if we can consider expert opinion in terms of a model that requires self-consistent estimate, it can help us start to rigorously work through the idea that our own opinions don't necessarily produce self-consistent results. Um, and so by putting it into a, a modeling framework that forces all the survivals and the recruitment and population size to be linked, um, allows us to test our own concepts. And then through that, if all else fails or integrated population model kind of simplifies down to a matrix model simulation where our expert opinion drives the variation in that simulation. And then as we get data, we can add it to the model and eventually the data will start to pull in, away from the expert opinion as the data starts to become more abundant. Okay, and so through this whole structure now, kind of loop back on ourselves. Uh, through going through our setting up our model structure, our observations, observation or biological model, our observation model. Now we've been able to get a window into our data needs. So our model now is defining what data are actually most efficient to collect. So we can look at what kinds of data produce the best information gain in the model. And then also how is best, how, what are the best ways to store that data for flexibility in the future and quality control now? And it can allow us to evaluate then the outcome. So if we're a model used to predict, then we can test different outcomes, say we want to do a translocation of bears to the Bitterroot Mountains. Uh, 
we can then use a population model to test under conditions we think are going on, what would the likely outcomes be? Okay. We've got all that data management modeling. Um, and there's quite a bit of complicated stuff on that. Given we only have an hour and a half today, I kind of glazed over a lot of mathematical details, the computational details. Um, but they're there, uh, but they don't necessarily have to be. So if we could have, so one way to make this easy is to have people working in a common interface. Um, so if we can bring all this together in, a, in common software that's accessible to biologists, we can make the whole thing run more smoothly, giving everyone the same access rather than everyone coming up with their own data storage and modeling structure. Uh, if we can get data stored all in a common format and centralized, we can come to cleaner data management, which helps all the modeling framework as well. And then all of that brought together can bring us to cleaner common results. So if everyone's working off the same underlying modeling strategy, with the same underlying data, if two biologists come and analyze the same population, if they start with the same assumptions, they'll come to the same results. So then the argument, rather than being, well, your population trajectory. So here we've got a population trajectory in the blue line, Gray is the uncertainty around that population, some dots representing data. If two different biologists come to this same system with the same data, um, then the only difference in the outcome of how they would model it is choices about assumptions of how the population is operating, not what the underlying data would be for the population. And so we can ask questions about, well, is recruitment annual? Does it vary annually or based on uh, huckleberry production? Or is it really fairly constant? Or yeah, same thing as adult survival, weather dependent, or is it fairly constant? We can start addressing questions and be able to address these assumptions based on this common underlying data it's all been stored and basically the models have been put together in a similar way. We might have other, our integrated population model also then gives us some common results that fall out, not necessarily as the way the data collected, but as sort of value added from the model. So we might then be able to produce something like, what are the proportions in each age class through time? Uh, and so we might not directly have that as it can be pretty variable going through time, but we can start to get out averages uh, and understand where all those different pieces of the data uh, link together to get us these proportions through time. And the common framework also allows us to start thinking about the scale problem. And so we view scale really as a data management problem more than a biological problem. Certainly there is the biology of how do animals operate at different scales. Uh, but you can always fit a model at almost any scale if the resolution of the data are there. Um, and so if data are stored in a common way that allows for a tracking of hierarchy from some lowest resolution, hopefully just a lat long or UTM of where that data point was collected on up through a scaled set of her, uh, population units to 
national parks to states to whatever the other set of units, uh, if we keep our data in a high quality format in the lowest possible resolution, we can make that scaling happen more easily. Okay, so how does it all work? Uh, if we're gonna build on these common ideas of multiple people being able to operate on the same data, being able to think about it in a common framework, there needs to be some sort of centralized operations. So some sort of centralized data storage, maybe it's on an agency stored thing, maybe it's some sort of private storage. Um, some external data sources, could be NDVI, it could be Snow, it could be some GIS layer of Huckleberry productivity, whatever it is, some, some groups producing some external data. Got all your users, um, whether they're on their computer or their phone or whatever they're doing. Um, then building a centralized hosted system can allow you to produce all the computation and reporting in a centralized way that makes it all run smoothly. Um, and so I argue that that helps us get to our sort of cycle of being able to define the population, store the data, data integrity all around because um, it's all in one central place. Okay, so we're thinking about our integrated population models. Um, how did we do in lining them up towards the governance pr principles that lined up at the beginning? Our first piece on the strategic and adaptive thinking. So the integrated population model gives us this chance of being able to think into the future and set up a set of goals um, that we want to get to. And so we can think about how we're moving towards that strategy. Um, we can modify the modeling framework to adapt to changes and to adapt to learning. Uh, the integrated population models force us to bring evidence into the situation, whether that evidence is purely data or it's the best theory we have to set up our process model. Uh, it brings that in and then directly provides information about decision-making processes or to provides information to decision-making processes. It gives us a chance to step back and be really transparent about our modeling framework. So if we, have an integrated population model, we have to be able to write down the math to get it done. There has to be computer code to do it. We can share that with other people, show them exactly step-by-step step what went on. Um, and that forces us to be accountable for the decisions we make. If we build mental models or a bunch of separate individual models and try and piece them together, it's much harder to say how you got to that final answer. So having a single coherent model gives you a much more transparent result. The inclusion part is kind of fun. Um, so if we step back to my ideas of bringing an expert opinion, we can bring in anyone's opinion. It's not necessarily an expert, um, plug it in in the same way. And if those ideas don't fit the biology, the model is not going to come to a solution or the solution it comes to is going to be really crazy. Um, and so you can directly allow different parties to bring in their opinions in the, in the underlying um, prior distribution or in that expert opinion piece. Um, and it'll sort out um, whose opinions actually meet some level of biological realism and whose don't. Uh, and in our experience, it's uh, 
lots of different parties' ideas don't necessarily match biology, including the biologists. And so it's good that we all take a deep breath and question how our own opinions are coming into the situation. And then finally, on the capacity to deliver conservation, uh, we have a chance that the models to directly predict future conditions, future um, results of the population model to perturbations in the system. And then from that, we can be able to evaluate how our conservation actually is going along. So quick summary there, I think we're, at least we're arguing that we can use integrated population models not as so much as a fancy statistical tool and because they're fun, which they are, but really as a way to provide better governance in wildlife management. Oh. Quick recap again, we've got integrated population model, which is half biology in the process, half sampling in the observation. It leads us to needing data. We can, we do a good job in developing statistical sampling. That makes everything a lot smoother, but we can use our observation models to help fix problems in sampling as well to some degree. There, if we think about where we are in our data, if you don't have any data at all, you can use your IPM as a simulation tool until data start to come along. If you have limited data, you'll start with a mix of simulation and fitting and then add data to it. If you already are sitting on a ton of data, you might be on some giant grizzly bear data set or some long-term black bear harvest data set, you might be able to start out with data-driven inference right away. Um, then I wanna just sort of take a second to finish with like, why are we really driven by this idea of modeling as a form of leading to better governance? Uh, and it really comes from risk. Like we're at a point where the legal risks to biologists actually having control over wildlife management decisions are real. Um, and if we don't use our data in an objective way, be able to defend how we used our data, how we made our decisions, store our data in a way that's controlled and high quality, we're at real risk of losing our ability to manage wildlife to state legislatures and other governing bodies that aren't really in the wildlife management business because we've lost our credibility. Uh, and so things like integrated population modeling and sticking to a set of defined good governance principles is one way to help us maintain our ability to stay in the game and in the con conversation about how decision-making and conservation implementation should be done. All right, so these Zoom things are always a bit Awkward. I've been sitting here talking for 56 minutes with no feedback, which makes me really self-conscious and uh, confused, but I'm going to take this extra half hour we have here to allow people to ask questions. I don't know if Josh has anything else to interject or Lori or anyone, but yeah, I'll just open it up for some questions and discussion now. I'll interject just a little bit. Um, so I think for some out there, there might be some interest in, given my existing monitoring program or given a budget cut 
or a budget enhancement, where should I spend money? And one of the things that these integrated population models have allowed us to do, and something that we're doing more of recently, is simulating data sets and then mimicking various monitoring programs and then throwing those, uh, the data produced by those fictitious monitoring programs into an IPM. And in that way, we gain an opportunity to quantify uh, estimates, uncertainty in terms of dollars, in terms of time. And it's really been a very cool thing for a lot of decision makers, I think. Um, there was a recent dissertation done by uh, Charlie Henderson as part of his PhD work, and that's available through the University of Montana uh, Library. And that talks a lot about some of these ideas. And I'm just bringing it up to say it's something that we uh, continue to push at because um, it, it's kind of neat to be able to say, you know, should I get survival or should I get abundance if I have $20,000 this year? Those are the kinds of things we can quantify. Along the way, though, much like how we had to quantify uh, our ideas about the biology of bears when building uh, a matrix model or a process model, we have to do the same thing with our risk, our uncertainty. What is a tight enough confidence or credible limit around an estimate? And it's led to some interesting sort of risk quantification conversations. And I think that is a, a really neat area for, for future research that somebody needs to take the flag up on. But all right, I'll stop. A couple of questions have come in. Paul, uh, why don't you start? You're muted, by the way. Thanks. All right, so first question, um, is there a data sharing platform we'd recommend? Um, so one case is we built our own. So Speedgoat runs one um, to build this sort of data sharing. Um, so that's one option, but really any sort of centralized server, um, like web-based server, like a SQL server kind of thing can handle the situation. Um, it's just a matter of having the staffing to build the structures. Yeah, I think that highlights the idea that when we're working with the integrated population models in these workflows, when you're trying to complete this loop, there really is a division of labor one person isn't gonna do all of it. Um, so yes, the centralized server is wonderful for sharing. That can come in the form of something like uh, Google Drive in a sort of a simple, if there's a simple use case. And one of the cool things about it is your work can be reproducible from that step forward. So there's an R package called Google Drive. It now works with the version four. You could always start from the raw data. It could be part of your code. Your code could be version controlled and shared on something like GitHub. And in that way, you start to build out this collaboration. There are a lot of coding collaboration tools, tons and tons and tons. GitHub alone will give you boards to do project management, issue tracking. You can comment and review each other's code. You can ask for other people to review. It's just a wonderful step in the right direction. Um. Yeah, so the second one was some literature on IPM implementations for management. Um, I will put some in the chat here in a minute if that works. Probably easier than trying to list them off. All right, next one. This is a great one. Um, so do IPMs treat data sources the same, even though you might have high confidence in some and low confidence in others? Um, the sort of basic integrated population models that were first developed did treat all data sources the same, other than by sample size. And so data sources with a big sample size would come in a lot more strongly than data sources with small sample size. And that was sort of sometimes a double problem because you would have a data set that you didn't trust, but it also, you could collect that data really easily. So you'd have a lot of it. And so you'd have a doubly, a super precise estimate 
from a data source you didn't trust. Um, and so uh, there are now ways of weighting your data sources within the integrated population model to uh, put higher levels of confidence on data sources you trust more. Uh, there's the other part too, and we relate to Josh's idea of simulating some data and deciding how much information content it comes from. If the, there may be data sources that the confidence in them is actually just low enough that you don't want to include them or the information content is just not there, they may actually be producing misinformation. Um, and so simulation can help us tease out some of those kinds of problems. There's a similar problem too with data sources that don't have a valid sampling design. It doesn't mean that you can't calculate a variance, but that variance is not legitimate. And that happens to us a lot. And so you end up like a thousand counts of something and you throw it in a binomial and you have this tiny, tiny standard error. It's great and all, but that data source is going to run the model. Yeah, I was chatting with Jim Nichols once and he put emphasis on yeah, integrating models, integrating data is great, but we should also ask if there are data sources that we should not integrate based on the quality alone. All right, so Frank, Joe's question can provide some perspectives regarding advantages, disadvantages of prior setting in a Bayesian environment. All right, Frank, you're really testing our, uh, our um, details here. I appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, the, a key piece, I didn't really go into to the, too much into the fact that we often use Bayesian, often we always use Bayesian model fitting in our integrated population models. You don't have to use Bayesian Fitting, but we tend to. And with Bayesian estimation, there's a prior uh, distribution for each parameter. So that's the distribution that describes what you think are the possible values for that parameter before you collect data. And so for survival, you might have a prior that's flat from zero to one, suggesting you have no idea. You just know that it's a survival and it has to be between zero and one. Or it might be belt shaped and have mean on 0.9 or so, where you think the likely outcome for a bear survival is. Um, and so there are methods for evaluating the influence of priors. So you can build your model under various priors and look at how the outcome changes based on the prior with the same data in each case. Um, but it also comes into some of these expert opinion things. You might use the prior as your expert opinion mode. Um, and so I guess if our perspective has um, been a bit fluid over the years, but I think we're coming into line with, we want to provide some prior information, especially in cases with, with limited data, uh, but we want to keep the bounds on that pretty wide. We don't want to, constrain it too tightly because there's enough we don't know out there that when we start combining all these priors together, we need some flexibility to be able to come up with a structure that actually can produce some re results that are reasonable. You have more to throw in on that one, Josh? No, I... I agree, like the, the last part that you brought in there about just making sure that it's fairly wide and you're not overstating what you think is really important. Of course, you can do prior sensitivity analyses and things like that to sort of get at the influence of your prior after the fact to a degree. Um, but I guess the example I always use, put it in like simple terms, the way I would think about it. it if you lost your keys and you're trying to go to work, and you decided that your keys had to be on the kitchen counter, and that was the only prior you were allowing yourself, the only place they could be, you would go in the kitchen, you would stand there, and if they weren't there, you would still just stand there and stare at the counter, and nothing would ever happen. Like, you're still just wrong. If you list it out next to the bed, a kitchen counter, maybe in the basement, maybe in the car, now you get to sort of collect data and update your information with this data. In the end, what we want to arrive at, I think, is something that is more along the lines of data-driven in inference. 
as much as possible. And so while we have strong opinions and they can play a very meaningful role, uh, we just don't want to overstate them. And we want to make sure that the data has a voice, that it has an ability to fight back, particularly when we are uh, honest <clears throat> with our sampling designs and the like. If we have something like survival data and we select some animals at random and we spread our collars out and we get a good estimate, it's not going to be that tight. You're going to know that adult female grizzly bear survival is 0.92, but it's going to go from 0.8 to 1. And you're not going to you're not going to tighten it down much more than that. And that's okay. It's just honest. All right. So I love the next question. Building IPMs into structured decision making perspective. Uh, in that same discussion I was having with Jim Nichols, Nichols that I referred earlier, the first thing he asked me was, so when are you putting your IPMs into a structured decision-making framework? Uh, um, and so I, this idea of, this, of the, the flipping the model over to be what helps you think about design, uh, model development and design for data, I think is really critical if I'm understanding the question, right? I, I really love the idea of building the model first and determining what data you need. So if you build the model, the process part of the model to handle the biology that you think is important, and to perhaps if you've got a, a set of models that are competing in your decision process, they handle those, those competing decisions. And then what data is it that actually informs the model to tease apart those differences? So if there's a hypothesis that leads to specific decisions, uh, we need the data to actually address that hypothesis, not just some other ancillary population data that may never actually get it. What we need to answer. I'm not sure if that really got at the question or not, but hopefully. <laughs> I'll uh, add to that that I think we are trying to make inroads on combining the approaches. Um, one such approach was not too long ago, we worked with someone who was enlisting opinions of experts about disease transmissions. And so we were able to build some tools where people could put their opinions in and sort of draw distributions in very qualitative ways. All of their guesses were then transferred to a common repository that was used to uh, build prior distributions. And then posteriors were simulated from those priors, which is sort of a novel use. And it was within the context of structured decision making, which was kind of neat. And uh, yeah, that was fun, fun to be part of. And uh, we're going to continue down this elicitation of expert opinion road and uh, something that I think is going to be really neat. There's a, a fun statistical concept which will make you uh, raise an eyebrow at first, but turns out kind of works. And that is that, that old idea of how many jelly beans are in the jar at the county fair, right? And so uh, turns out that most of us are wrong when we guess and we're way wrong. But when you combine everyone's guesses, they build a distribution that pretty well predicts what's in the jar. And so um, just using that as sort of an analogy, it's, that's a, it's a direction that I think that where structured decision-making these Bayesian priors and, and the IPMs and all of these things, that's sort of the, the grounds on, on which they meet in my mind. Awesome. Does anyone have any other questions or any comments? Oh, it looks like you just Mike Swy. Okay, so um, I think you're asking about genetic data in, in terms of identifying popula common populations based on 
interactions of breeding. Um, so I've never seen an IPM that actually incorporates those population designations, but we often use similar data to first define the data structures of where the sort of geographic boundaries should be on a population. And then from there, um, build a population model. Certainly we've used a lot of genetic data to like genetic marker capture stuff to estimate abundance. And that can go directly into an integrated population model in a nice way. Um, Often in uh, the sort of management context that we're working, we would not quite get to the point of having enough data to do this, but there is another class of models called integral population model where you might actually track individuals. And I know that's not exactly what you're talking about, but in the monitoring context, we typically have to make the concession that a population is closed to, it's just a parsimony argument really. And it's, it aligns better with the resources that are available. And so we just needed to find the populations at the outset. Immigration, immigration, absolutely like very straightforward how you might incorporate those as long as you had something, some measure. Um, although there is a nice paper by Abadi and Shab about uh, estimating weight and parameters and in integration integrated population models. So it is possible actually, if you don't have data on something to estimate what its value would be. Um, just a few thoughts that Mike's question brought to mind for me. All right, so the next question is helpful would be to have a specific model to reduce parameters. Um, so you can sort of tr test hypotheses in your data through having a, a process model that includes specific ideas. So it's been like a, a trend. So the one thing to keep in mind though, is that abundance is not really a population parameter. It's the outcome of the processes involved. So it's some kind of recruitment and survival. And so if we're really gonna have a specific question, it should be on the population processes. So we could put a trend in survival, we could put a trend in recruitment. Um, to understand what's going on there. If we put a trend in abundance, we have a weird sort of fight in the model of about how survival and, and recruitment can move such to meet that trend in abundance. So Lori, is there a way we could actually email a a uh, citation list out. I was trying to think of how I'm going to get these citations up on here fast enough to answer the earlier. Yeah, no, we can we can put out an email list. Um, we can put if you can put a document together, we can put it on the website, or we can um, and we can link. I'll put a link in the notifications too. So okay. yeah, yeah. About putting that all together, um, put it into a document. We can get it out to everybody. Okay, we'll do it that way then. Awesome.